Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to Bethesda Presbyterian and welcome to worship. We have several announcements today, but first I want to give Joyce the floor. Okay, so just to reiterate, it is uh, the youth auction, November 5th, and uh, today, starting today, they need help at 2 o'clock moving stuff in the fellowship hall. Um, let me also uh, offer up a thanks for those who helped out with Trunk or Treat. It was wildly successful, um, from my understanding, in comparison to last year. We ran out of hot dogs and um, had several trunks. So thank you uh, for you who served and uh, donated a trunk and visited for Trunk or Treat. Uh, also, just a word about Walker McDonald. If you're following his story, Walker um, received some burns, and he was supposed to be in the hospital for three months. Our church is committed to praying for him, and he is home now after about three or four weeks. So that's praise be to God. Uh, his recovery is happening quickly. Also today, we're having the two-cent a meal, so the children will be running around with buckets collecting your change for two-cent a meal before the moment with young disciples. Also, we have um, to remember to fill out your time and talent sheets. Those pledge cards will be distributed this week, and Cons Consecration Sunday is next week. Um, so we'll have Consecration Sunday next week, and we'll also have Communion. Uh, also note your bulletin, there's a little typo on the sermon, it's on self-justification. We're preaching on self-justification today because this Sunday is Reformation Sunday, when we remember the Protestant Reformers. We also are packing into this All Saints Day and remembering those who've passed away, and we will light a candle for the members who've passed away this year. If there are no other announcements... Let's worship. I'm sorry, Kay. Kay is going to come up and introduce uh, the 50th question from the Westminster Catholic. Good morning. Before we do the review, I have two things to tell you. First of all, the bookmarks in, your, in the Bibles today, we want you to use them however you wish. You can use them to mark the scriptures or hymns, whatever you like, but the bookmarks are for you to use today in worship. 
And the second thing I want to tell you is starting next Sunday, November 6th, we are going to have our first birthday celebration. It will be during, we're going to celebrate uh, our actually, yeah, celebrate. I guess you could call it celebrate. The birthdays of the people who are born in the month of November next Sunday. And it will be during the breakfast time. And breakfast starts around 9.15. And we want you to come. And we will, um, we will uh, talk about the people who are born during November and recognize them. And we will serve a special coffee cake so please everyone come and we will do this the first Sunday of every month to recognize the people's uh, birthdays that month. So please come. So now we're gonna look at question 50 from the Shorter Catechism. What does the second commandment require? Would you read that answer with me? The second commandment requires us to receive respectfully perform and preserve completely and purely all the regulations for religion and worship that God has established in his word. Thank you. Deuteronomy 32, 46, and 47. This is Moses as he was speaking to the Israelites before they were going into the promised land. Take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law, for it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. The word of God is the life of God's people, for through it, we learn God's truths his promises, and his amazing blessings. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful. From the Catechism for Young Children, question 50, what is justification? And the answer, it is God's forgiving sinners and treating them as if they never sinned. God's word tells us that God loves us so much that he gave his perfect son so that we could live eternally with him. We are justified through Christ. Amen.
Please stand. Scripture says, if we draw near to God, draw, God will draw near to us. Let us draw near to God with the call to worship. We have come to affirm our historic faith. To worship God with our mothers and fathers. We have come to remember God's benefits to us, the living. We have come to affirm our trust in the God of all futures. Let us worship.
Remain standing for the confession. Scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let us pray this prayer of confession together. This day we remember those who have gone before us willing to stand up for what they knew was right. We consider how you, O God, have called us to stand up for the truth. However, we have often done so without loving others. You show us the truth worth defending is rooted in love for one another. So we confess to you today all the times we have not loved as you love. We fail to be selfless and instead do what feels easy or what comes naturally. Forgive us, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ has died for us. Christ has risen for us. Christ reigns over us, and Jesus Christ prays for us. In Jesus' name, believe, and you are forgiven. Be at peace. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's the peace.
greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, mind and your strength. strength. Uh, we, we did a different one last week, but to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Okay, today we're going to do the second commandment. Does anyone know what the second commandment is? second greatest command. <coughs> to love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? The person nearest you? The person near you? There's also another part of this I want you to remember. And that's what Jesus says to love your enemies. Can you say that? Enemies. Yes. Jesus says love our neighbors and our enemies. You know what an enemy is? Yes. What's an enemy? Yes. Someone who's mean to you. What else? Someone who wants to maybe... Oh, yeah. That, that could be an enemy, yeah. Somebody who's jealous. Do you guys have any enemies? No. <coughs> no, that's good. When we grow up, you might get some. But Jesus says we, we should love our neighbors, and that includes loving our enemies. So I want you to remember that. You love, we are called to love God and our neighbors and our enemies. All right? Can we pray again? All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for loving us first. Help us to love you. Going to let the children take up money more often. <laughs> Let's pray. Holy Father, your word tells us that only the spiritual understand the scriptures. So we pray you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Help us to hear your word today. The same word that moved the reformers to protest, and to push the church back to your word. The same word that continues to speak to us today, here, gathered around this pulpit and table. Pour out your spirit and help us to hear it. And not only to hear it, but to do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, beginning on verse 1 to verse 13. Hear the reading. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, 
and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The New Testament reading comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Hear the reading. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Given that today is Reformation Sunday, I would like to preach a sermon on self-justification in honor of Martin Luther. I know we have many Lutherans in the congregations, in this congregation. And uh, just a reminder that Martin Luther was a man who refused to let the church forget that we are justified. God justifies those who believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, a good friend of mine, a Lutheran actually, is a reckless driver. Reckless might not even be the right word for it. Wreck prone would be a better word. I I mean, he can get you from point A to point B quicker than anyone I know. He has a clean driving record, thanks to a few lawyers And he's more than competent behind the wheel. But he's a dangerous driver. Dangerous because he has little self-awareness when he's flying. I mean driving. (laughs) Once we were driving through a very busy city, going, 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 thud. What was that, he said? A Mercedes, Christopher. A Mercedes that just lost its side mirror. No. Did you see it? Yes. Did anyone else? (laughs) The greatest moment of his deadly lack of self-awareness was a time we were in the mountains. We had seven people in a small van, and my friend was driving hastily on this winding back road atop a ridge. I can recall it vividly this day. The road was a precarious one. It was about one and a half lanes, but the sun is setting, and despite the treacherous pass, it has one of the most astounding skies you've ever seen. Even uh, It looks as if the sun is plummeting down from the heavens, diving onto earth, pulling down all the colors of the universe with it. So my friend, he decides to pause and witness God's handiwork. He pulls this eight passenger van over to the six inch I guess you could call it a shoulder no guardrail no lines just a massive drop my friend Christopher he he climbs out of the driver's seat he walks around he stands in front of this van and he gazes out at this once in a lifetime view the rest of us remain in the vehicle wasn't much space on the shoulder, you'll recall. And we're equally wowed by the scene. Our eyes are glued for a little while. In one of those moments that you just really don't know how long it actually is. And then my friend finally climbs back into the van silently and goes to put the van into drive. But he stops and stares at me, almost blank white. And our eyes meet over the gear shift. 
He doesn't need to put the van in drive because it's still in drive. <laughs> he actually never parked the van. And so there we were with this one-ton machine still in drive, sitting on a cliff, while the driver stood obliviously in front of the vehicle. We discovered that the only thing holding the van from plummeting into that precipice was a small rock that I named Thank You God. <laughs> you can imagine the headlines. If that rock had not been there, Seven passengers found in the bottom of this valley, van obliterated, driver mysteriously run over by the van he was driving. Now I've told him what I think, what I know about his driving. I've used kind words, direct words, even choice words in the moment. But finally one day he looked at me and he said, you know, when a lot of people a lot of different people have been telling you the same thing over and over and over. You begin to think, hey, there might be some truth to it. And all that goes to show is that there's a tremendous irony about the human condition. The self doesn't really know itself. Even though we're in the driver's seat, so to speak, of our lives, we don't always see, know, or want to own up to our weaknesses. Even when different people keep telling us the same thing over and over and over, it still doesn't ring true. Even when our faults are glaringly obvious to our closest companions, they can be totally hidden from us. Now, I think it's safe to say that's the root of a lot of our spiritual vices. We don't know the strength or the depth of the sin in our lives. We are not fully aware of our temptations and tendencies to run straight off the narrow road into the plummeting valley of sin. We're misinformed about ourselves by ourselves. Most likely because we're biased. We tend to like ourselves and we want to justify ourselves. No, no, I tell my wife, I'm not speeding. I'm just keeping up with everyone else. Amen? <laughs> or maybe deep down we don't like ourselves and we need to justify ourselves all the more. That's what's really wrong with the Pharisee in the gospel story today. His problem is not that he's a Pharisee. His problem is that he thinks he can justify himself based on his good deeds and by comparing himself to others which ends up revealing, manifesting his own capacity for self-deception. In the parable, Christ describes how this Pharisee and tax collector go up to a temple to pray. The Pharisee, we read, was standing by himself, and he prays, God, I thank you I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all my income. Now the tax collector, on the other hand, it says he's standing far off. And you'll remember last week, we talked about that metaphor of folks standing far off from God. He's got his head sunk down and he's beating his chest, crying out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now Jesus interprets this parable for us. This tax collector, he says, went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. That's one of Luke's major themes. The whole gospel is all about unexpected reversals. The exalted are humbled. The humbled are exalted. The rich become poor. The poor become rich. The hungry become full, and the full become hungry. And in this story, the sinner in search of mercy is the one who finds that they are actually right with God. The sin that put them far off brought them home when they confessed it. But the righteous, the seemingly righteous, the seemingly pious person intent to justify himself is the one who is condemned. 
which is how Jesus describes his ministry. I have come to save sinners, not the self-reported righteous. This is the great, great irony of the Pharisees' self-justification. It doesn't justify him or make him right with God. Jesus' parable illustrates this perfectly. The Pharisees' prayer is a thanksgiving prayer that God has not made him like thieves and rogues and adulterers or even this tax collector. Thank you, God, I'm not like this guy. That's not a model prayer, by the way. But as we all know by the end of the story, this guy, this tax collector, is the one that Jesus declares justified. That means the Pharisee has just given a wholehearted thank you to God for not being like the one who receives God's mercy. In effect, he says something like this. Thank you, God, that I'm too good to be in a place to receive your forgiveness. He thanks God for not being the kind of sinner that God can save. Turns out, his self-justification is self-incrimination. He just doesn't realize it. And that's the issue. He just doesn't realize it. He's unaware. For all his self-righteousness, the Pharisee is not in tune with his self. He reports that he fasts twice a week. He tithes, but he doesn't necessarily think he's good for this. No, instead he uses those things to separate himself from others, from thieves and rogues and tax collectors. This is a version of self-righteousness we overlook. You see, we often think self-righteousness is, look at everything I'm doing, God. I can earn my salvation. No, this is a more subtle form of self-righteousness. It's more about comparing yourself to others and other people standing before God. You see, the Pharisee is not claiming to have climbed Jacob's ladder. The Pharisee is just saying, look, God, I'm not on the bottom rung. I fast, I tithe, I'm not this guy. And so his deeper problem is that his self-righteousness isn't really in touch with who he really is. He's actually not concerned with himself. He's worried about other people. And even though the scripture says he's standing by himself, his own standing before God is based on how he judges other people. Think about that. His own standing before God is based on other people. Which might suggest something about why I started my story about my friends driving and not my own. After all, my wife does have an invisible brake pedal on her side of the car. And she has used kind and repetitive and choice words while I'm driving too but I still have a hard time believing her. The Bible tells us that self-justification and measuring ourselves against others is this sinful reflex that's deeply ingrained in our lives. And in our Old Testament story today, we see this in the very beginning. God says, Adam, why did you eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when I told you not to? He says, well, Eve offered it to me. And if you notice, he doesn't just say Eve offered it to me. He says, Eve, the one you gave me. He's blaming God there. It's dangerous to blame your wife, but it's really dangerous to blame God. Eve, who you offered it, who offered to me. And then he says to Eve, why did you eat the fruit? Well, the serpent gave it to me. The shifting of blame. The pushing it off to the other person. Both Adam and Eve and the Pharisee reveal this age-old strategy of trying to shift God's attention to the good things we do and the bad things other people do. 
so that maybe God will realize we're not that bad. But God's not deceived. God's not deceived. We're deceived. Self-deception lies at the root of so many of our spiritual problems. And it's because it's hard to come to terms with our faults and our weaknesses. It's easy to recognize the faults and weaknesses of others, and we want God to have the same perspective. Now, driving, I think, is the perfect illustration of self-justification. It's never more obvious to me where self-justification comes alive and condemnation comes alive and our condemnation to other comes alive than when we're driving, especially on one. But this capacity we have for ironic delusion, self-delusion, it, it touches every area of our life, not, not just on the highway, but in our hearts, our minds, in our churches. Notice all this doesn't play out out in the world. It plays out right there in the temple, near God. It plays out everywhere. But the tax collector, Jesus gives us the tax collector because he's a different model. He sees himself for he, who he really is. He sees himself as a sinner. And by doing that, by looking at himself, notice he's not looking around. He's standing far off, looking at himself. He's got his head down, beating his breast. He has no need to look around and point to others. It's a lesson for us. When we come to terms with the gravity of our own sinfulness, when we come to terms with all of our moral failings, and when we regularly examine ourselves and we make a habit out of confessing our sins and our deep need for God's mercy, we have a great safeguard from the temptation to look to and point at others. Look at them, God. I'm not as bad as them. When we practice confession and seek God's mercy regularly, we won't delude ourselves in thinking we're more righteous than others. And so this Reformation Sunday, don't compare yourself to others. Confess your own sins and thank God that he justifies us through Jesus. And that none of us drive like that Lutheran. <laughs> Amen. Please stand with me and let's affirm our faith by reciting... The ancient creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.
may be seated. Scripture says, don't give under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. If you give today, give cheerfully. Church that's asleep, that you would wake it up and raise it up to faithfulness. 
We pray, Lord, for the churches in our surrounding area and the church here at Bethesda, that you would empower this congregation with renewed sense of gifts, that we would serve one another and bless our community with the good news. We give you thanks and praise for Walker and his healing. And we lift up today all of those saints and members here who have gone before us. Ray, Johnny, Catherine, Dottie, Georgie, Louise, Jane, Doris, Dot, Patty, and all those other loved ones we lift up to you. We ask you for the lost, the lonely, the widow, the orphan, the broken, and all who need you. We lift to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us lift up one more closing hymn, 730. 